Hello everyone, I'm Tom Kiernan, President and CEO of American Rivers. We're here today to announce America's most endangered rivers for 2023. In a minute, you're gonna hear from many of our wonderful partners about each of the rivers that are on the list this year and why protecting them is so important. But first, I wanna speak about the unique moment that we're in right now. The value of rivers and clean water has never been more clear because human health and public safety depend on healthy rivers. And the lives of the fish and the wildlife also depend on healthy rivers. Simply put, life depends on rivers. Unfortunately, our rivers have never been more threatened than they are right now. And the reason is there are three interconnected crises that have emerged in the last couple of decades that are dramatically degrading the health of our rivers. First, the climate crisis. We are seeing daily floods, droughts, and impacts on our rivers that are exacerbated by climate change. An impact not just on rivers, but on our water supply and our source for drinking water. The second crisis is that we are losing nature. We are losing species in rivers at twice the rate of land-based and ocean-based species. And third, injustice and inequity are preventing rivers from being cleaned up and restored in all places. Currently, rivers that are more polluted, water that is dirtier, is disproportionately harming communities of color and tribal nations. For those of us who love rivers, who understand the value of healthy rivers and clean water, we have to act and we have to act now, given that our rivers have never been more threatened. And that is why American Rivers releases every year our most endangered rivers and why it's so powerful. This is our 38th year of the most endangered rivers for America. It's a list that speaks to the urgency, the significance of the threats that our rivers are facing. And each river comes with a specific call to action that all of you can take and help influence the outcome and the health of these rivers. By teaming up with our local partners to shine a spotlight on these rivers and by amplifying your voice, we can make a difference for these rivers. Together, we can get results and we can save these rivers. So now I invite you to sit back and listen to the Most Endangered Rivers announcements for 2023. Thank you very much. Ten rivers, ten solutions, ten opportunities to improve river health and the health of our communities. These are America's most endangered rivers of 2023. Number one, Colorado River's Grand Canyon. On the Colorado River, climate change is threatening the drinking water supplies for 40 million people and putting the iconic Grand Canyon at risk. Number two, Ohio River. On the Ohio River, pollution threatens the lifeblood of six states and the drinking water for five million people. Number three, Pearl River. The natural treasure of Mississippi's Pearl River is threatened by a development scheme that would destroy wildlife habitat and worsen Jackson's water crisis. Number four, Snake River. On the Pacific Northwest's Snake River, four dams are driving salmon to extinction, violating treaties and commitments to tribal nations and holding the region back from economic opportunity. Number five, Clark Fork River. Toxic pollution on Montana's Clark Fork River poses a serious health risk to fish, wildlife, and people. Number six, Eel River. On California's Eel River, two obsolete dams have devastated salmon, steelhead, and lamprey runs, threatening tribal culture and sustenance. Number seven, Lehigh River. Poorly planned development along Pennsylvania's Lehigh River threatens water quality and wildlife habitat. Number eight, Chilkat and Klahini Rivers. 
On Alaska's Chilkat and Klehini Rivers, the habitat for the largest concentration of bald eagles in the world is threatened by pollution from a proposed copper and zinc mine. Number 9. Rio Gallinas. Climate change and outdated forest management threatens New Mexico's Rio Gallinas and the people and wildlife the river supports. Number 10. Okefenokee Swamp. And in the unique wetland of Georgia's Okefenokee Swamp, a proposed titanium mine threatens clean water and wildlife habitat. I'm on the south rim of the Grand Canyon, one of our nation's greatest natural treasures and one of the world's best expressions of wild nature. A sacred place of deep cultural significance, it is also a beloved recreation and travel destination and home to threatened and endangered plants and animals. It is also America's most endangered river in 2023. Rising temperatures and severe drought, driven by climate change, combined with outdated river management and overallocation of limited water supplies, put this iconic river at serious risk. Years of water crisis have already taken a toll on the health of the river as it flows through Grand Canyon, with lower flows and eroding beaches impacting important habitat as well as cultural and recreational values. As it makes critical decisions about water management along the Colorado River, the Bureau of Reclamation must consider the environment a key component of human health and public safety and prioritize the ecological health of the Grand Canyon. The Colorado River flows nearly 1,500 miles from the Rocky Mountains to the sea in Mexico. Along its way, the river traverses some of the driest and hottest areas of the country, providing drinking water to 40 million people, including some of the nation's largest cities, including Los Angeles, Phoenix, Las Vegas, and Denver, as well as 30 federally recognized tribes. The Colorado River provides irrigation water for nearly 6 million acres of ranch and farmland, including farms that grow 90% of this country's winter vegetables. The river is also the engine of a recreational economy dependent on adequate river flows and water supplies to operate. In all, the basin feeds a $1.4 trillion economy, integrally connected to the broader national economy. In response to more than two decades of dry years throughout the Colorado River Basin, in 2022, the Bureau of Reclamation took emergency actions to protect infrastructure at Lake Powell. Despite the prospect of an above average water year in 2023, which might buy a little time for the basin, reducing water deliveries and resulting changes in flows through Glen Canyon Dam and into the Grand Canyon in the coming years is inevitable. Altering flows from Glen Canyon Dam has significant impacts on the Grand Canyon. The prolonged drought and accelerating impacts from climate change triggering falling lake levels at Lake Powell has already caused significant harm within the canyon. If future flows are severely altered without consideration for the environment, it could further devastate the Grand Canyon's irreplaceable natural, cultural, and recreational values. For many, the Grand Canyon and its surroundings are sacred. Reducing releases from the dam to turn the river into a mere trickle would not only impact native fish, plants and wildlife, but also the health and well-being of those who are inextricably tied to this place. More than a dozen Native American tribes and pueblos revere the canyon, and millions of people a year find awe, healing, and excitement just by being in and around this place. These challenges are serious threats to the health and well-being of both people and the environment, and if not solved, could do serious, lasting harm to arguably the most recognizable stretch of river in the country and to all the people who love it. We, we did this earlier today, and I just would like everybody to close their eyes and think of the Ohio River and what it means to you.
The Ohio River is rich in biodiversity and recreation and tourism opportunities and the ability for boaters and anglers to come and spend their money in our towns and our small businesses. Yet the Ohio River is not considered a place to come and recreate and enjoy time in nature, yet it has abundant resources and could truly thrive and be a vital lifeblood for our communities. The Ohio River has a history of significant industrialization from mining and resource extraction for energy production, for durable goods manufacturing, as well as chemical production. And this has left a history of toxic discharges and ongoing threats to the health of the entire river basin from ecosystems to drinking water safety acid mine drainage as well as toxic chemical releases have left a history of dioxins and PFAS within the water system. And while we face many challenges, including the need for increased flood resilience in the face of climate change, the biggest threat to the river is that we are not federally designated as a distinct water system. There are multiple federal water systems like the Everglades, the Great Lakes, the Puget Sound, all of which receive tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars each year for restoration initiatives. And right now, the Ohio River doesn't have a piece of that pie. We know that this region has immense importance as great biodiversity, recreation opportunities, it provides drinking water for millions. We also know that there are really severe and serious problems that impact our public health and our drinking water and our way of life. And we know that unless we address these problems now, they're only gonna get worse and more expensive. So what we see is a great opportunity to partner with the federal government to really invest in this region, to clean up this region, to restore this region, and also protect it for future generations. My Ohio River deserves to be protected from polluters for the sake of the birds. The Ohio River is a shared resource that belongs to the community as a whole. And my Ohio River Valley deserves environmental justice. We need disproportionate investment back into communities that have been left out of the environmental movement because of race, socioeconomics, or other factors. My Ohio River needs funding sources that can see past city, county, state, and federal agency lines. From kayaks and canoes to commercial barges and pleasure craft, My Ohio River provides opportunity for work and play. We must protect and improve this vital resource now and forever. We're hearing that people do care about their communities, they care about their drinking water, they care about their public health. They want to see pollution cleaned up. They also want to see pollution prevented. People have to be part of the solution. Without the people, this is not as powerful, not as impactful. And with people and with communities, with their input, and with their priorities, this is going to be a much stronger product and will have a much longer lasting life onto the future. The Pearl River is the single source of drinking water for Jackson, Mississippi, and hundreds of other municipalities and industries. The Pearl supplies clean, fresh water to the Gulf of Mexico to support the region's oyster, crab, shrimp, and tourism industries. And the Pearl River provides habitat to more than 300 species of birds, fish, and wildlife, including several rare, threatened, and endangered species. The Pearl River Basin is teeming with wildlife. People living along the Pearl have close ties to the land and they feed their families on the basin's bounty. They eat crawfish and catfish and white-tailed deer. The locals pick mayhaw and blackberries to make jellies and pies, and they harvest chanterelle mushrooms in the summertime. A private real estate development threatens the Pearl River. The One Lake Development Project would dredge 10 miles of the Pearl River, disturbing at least eight known highly contaminated toxic disposal sites, install a dam to impound the river, blocking fish passage, disrupting critical freshwater flows, increasing water temperatures, and worsen flash flooding in Jackson, Mississippi. We're in LaFleur's Bluff State Park, and this area is ground zero for the One Lake Project. 
basically a zombie project that's been proposed first in 1996, uh, proposed, denied, proposed, refused, but keeps coming back, and it's, it's back again. Basically a development project masquerading as flood control. One lake poses severe threats to the Pearl's biodiversity. The dam would stop threatened Gulf sturgeon from swimming upstream to spawn. The dredging and snag removal would destroy basking and nesting sites for two turtles found nowhere else in the world. The Pearl River is the stronghold for the swallowtail kite, a bird that I've studied for 30 years. These graceful birds of prey need a healthy river to survive. Swallowtail kites bathe and drink on the river. They feed on dragonflies and mayflies that they snatch out of the air. And these aquatic insects can accumulate heavy metals and other toxins that are discharged into the river. Reduced flow caused by one lake will increase toxin concentrations in the pearl. Kites and other wildlife can't afford any more pollution. I've spent pretty much every day as a child and now as an adult on the Pearl River. Our river really is our way of life. We spend all of our time out there. We take friends and family out there. A lot of people hunt and fish and recreate and just live on the river. I own Honey Island Kayak Tours where I take guests from all over the world to see the beautiful Pearl River and the surrounding swamps. I'm worried about how it may affect the flow of our river. We are in the floodplain here. And then in the deep summer months is when our water is low. And sometimes it's already hard for me to operate my kayak tours because there isn't any water. If it gets any lower than it is, I will not be able to operate my business. The One Lake Project is being reviewed by the Army Corps of Engineers, Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Environmental Protection Agency. We need you to tell these agencies to stop One Lake and save the Pearl River. Let's do the smart thing for people and wildlife. What we need is one river, no lake. One river, no lake. Stop, Stop the, the One Lake, lake project, project now. now. American River's 2023 Most Endangered Rivers list has the Snake River as number four. And that's because this is a, an incredibly important time for Snake River salmon and steelhead. The Snake Basin is really the beating heart of salmon country in the lower 48 states. It's just an incredibly special place. You know, the Snake is a tributary of the Columbia, but really it's an equal part of the Columbia. There are these two massive systems that come together and create the most productive salmon habitat in the lower 48 states. Historically, we're talking somewhere between 10 and 16 million salmon that returned to the Columbia Basin, and the Snake Basin was responsible for half of that production. Today, we're at a fraction of that, that kind of a population with a million fish coming back to the Columbia Basin. And snake, salmon, and steelhead are all listed under the Endangered Species Act. So you have what was once the greatest salmon and steelhead stream or river in the country, and now it's just kind of a shadow of its former self. And a lot of that is because of these four run of river dams between Lewiston, Idaho, and Tri-Cities, Washington. About three to 5% of juvenile fish die just from the top of each dam to the bottom of each dam. When you've got eight dams in your way, that's a lot of mortality just from falling over a dam or going through a turbine. But what we don't talk about it nearly enough is the impacts from the warm water reservoirs that are behind the dams. We spend a lot of time talking about improving fish passage and improving survival through the hydro system, but there's nothing you can do to mitigate turning a free flowing river into a warm water bathtub. There's no engineering, there's no human intervention that can change that. So instead of having a free flowing cold water system, we've dammed these into a series of lakes that sit there and bake in the sun all summer. So you have temperature impacts where the water temperature behind reservoirs, oftentimes from July throughout the rest of the summer, exceeds 70 degrees, which can be lethal for juvenile salmon and for adult salmon. And you also created an environment that's much more hospitable to predators that like to eat juvenile salmon, walleye and bass. And you also have avian predators, cormorants and osprey and eagles and sublethal effects from swimming through lakes instead of getting flushed out of a river as they naturally would. The biggest dial we have to turn is removing the lower four snake river dams. It will have the largest impact that we have control over in recovering these salmon and steelhead. We can't do that without replacing the services the dams provide first. 
So any sort of regional solution for salmon recovery in the Pacific Northwest relies on federal leadership and the leadership of our elected leaders in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Montana to come together and provide a vision for the Northwest that recovers fish species, but also keeps the industries that rely on the services these lower Snake River dams provide whole. Governor Inslee and Senator Murray made that clear in their recent report that came out late last year. And so that's what American Rivers is working towards is finding pragmatic solutions, hosting solutions-based conversations with stakeholders to identify what those needs are so that we can replace the services, take out the dams, so that we can recover salmon and steelhead species and these communities can live in harmony with rather than in opposition to salmon and steelhead and the folks that value those fish species for their way of life. There's more support from elected leaders, from members of the public, and from impacted industries than we've ever seen before. There's a sense of momentum and inevitability around dam removal that's making this an issue that people have to engage in. So we're really looking for folks to come together to find solutions, to solve problems for salmon and steelhead, and for the rural communities that rely on the Snake River dams, so that we have a holistic solution rather than someone from out of the region making decisions. Now is the time for action on Snake River. We have a very limited window before these species start waking out in the Snake Basin. If we wait, we will miss the opportunity not only for federal funding, but we'll also miss the opportunity to preserve species before they're no longer here. Of all the rivers, the Clark Fork has always been my favorite. I've been a guide and outfitter on this river for over 26 years, and I've probably logged, you know, thousands of miles down the Clark Fork River. So the relationship is pretty intimate. It's always been special to me because of the fish. They're dry fly oriented, so, you know, the dry fly fishing can be really good at times. They're aggressive, they're strong, and, you know, they're not easy to find. We see this river as a, as a lifeline to the landscape of western Montana. On any given summer day, you'll see flotillas of folks using the river uh, recreationally. So it's become a catalyst for this community being healthy, being vibrant, being economically engaged with the landscape. And that is what we would want to see continue all the way down the Clark Fork River. Murphy operated for decades as a pulp paper plant, an industrial facility. But the processes that all of those, those companies who occupied that site had a role in is what we are left dealing with. It's like being punched in the gut when you have something like that in, in that location. The Clark Fork River is in the heart of our ancestral homeland. And for our Salish and Kalespe and Kasanka people, caretaking and having that responsibility for the water quality and, and the, all the life that it gives is a critical element for the tribes. When you talk about chemical contaminants that might be in the fish tissue and how that lives on, what does that do to your culture? Over the last 35 years, Montana has made incredible progress, healing the scars of the Clark Fork's hardworking past. And now the river is really making a comeback, and it's become the heartbeat of our towns. Yet a major wrench in the Clark Fork's recovery is the shuttered Smurfett Stone Mill site, especially its unlined waste dumps that leak toxic chemicals into groundwater connected to the river. It's been 13 years since the mill closed down, and despite years of studies, the EPA has yet to take action. Our river and our communities cannot wait. Please join us in calling on the EPA to clean up Smurfett's toxic waste dumps now. The Eel River is one of California's largest rivers, spanning 3,500 square miles from the Snow Mountain Wilderness and the Mendocino National Forest all the way to the coast. The river is also the ancestral and current home of the Wiat, Sinkione, Classic, Bungado, Yuki, and Wailaki people. The Eel River has been the backbone of our community and it supports a, a whole ecosystem. 
of the things that we need to, to be supportive of our families. It's, it's a great part of each one of us. For anglers, the eel is really a special place and holds a special place in our hearts. It used to be one of the most productive salmon rivers in California with Chinook runs up to 800,000 fish and in, in good years, all the species combined up to a million fish, which is really incredible. The eel's thriving ecosystem was drastically altered with the construction of the Cape Horn Dam in 1908 and the Scott Dam in 1922, together known as the Potter Valley Project. These dams decimated culturally and economically important fisheries for indigenous people, destroyed critical habitats and spawning grounds, and caused a proliferation of invasive species and toxic algae. You know, one of the unfortunate things with this project is it was built in a time where we just didn't do environmental review or, you know, talk to the tribes before this project was built. So it was really built in a, in a different time by, by different people that didn't have the same values we do now. The Potter Valley Project as it exists today is no longer economically viable. It no longer provides the reliable water supply that people need, nor does it provide habitat for salmon or steelhead. And future droughts and climate change are only going to make matters worse. So we know the headwaters, even in the last several drought years, have cold water year round. For fish, it's super important to have that cold water habitat so they can make it through their first summer of life. It's also a relatively well protected upper watershed. It's in Mendocino National Forest. A lot of it borders wilderness. Much of the lower Eel River is protected as well. So it's really a chance to make a salmon stronghold and a refuge for these fish as climate change progresses. Now, with PG&E's recent decision to surrender their license to operate both dams, there's an enormous opportunity to reconnect what would become California's longest free-flowing river. So ultimately, where we're at in this project really comes down to PG&E and what they decide to do with these dams. You know, and our hope is they'll decide to get them out of the river, you know, because of the significant damage that they cause. And if water users decide they still want to keep a water diversion, we're more than willing to work with them on a way to do that that no longer harms the Eel River, you know, certainly not in the way that these dams have, have caused harm over the last 100 years. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC, needs to hold PG&E to account and require them to fully remove the Scott and Cape Horn dams as a vital part of their decommissioning process. Failure to do so would only exacerbate the ecological crisis already at play. This is the chance of a lifetime. You know, it's, it's our one big opportunity to get these dams out of the river. Uh, you know, we have a company that's being semi-cooperative about not wanting to operate this project anymore. And we really hope that they'll be making the right decision here and, and proposing dam removal as part of their decommissioning plan. Reading Rapids is magic. It is pure magic. It's like learning a new language. If you allow yourself to be fully present and you watch a feature like a wave, you can actually see the river pulse. It's the presence and that willingness to witness that allows you to follow the flow. And this river led me to my chosen family. It's provided me with a community of wacky, wild, and wonderful people. I know that the bonds I have with the people that I run rapids with will never break. The Lehigh River is my home. It's my heart. The Lehigh River is the longest tributary of the Delaware River, totaling 109 miles in length from its headwaters in the glacial bogs of Wayne County, Pennsylvania, to its confluence with the Delaware River in the city of Easton. Since indigenous peoples first contact with Europeans, the Lehigh River has been forced to demonstrate resilience at every turn. Surviving contamination with coal and coal waste, abandoned mine drainage, erosion and sediment from heavy logging, and industrial pollution from the steel and cement industries. Despite this toxic legacy, the Lehigh River has demonstrated incredible resilience, and the upper reaches remain some of the most pristine in the Delaware River Basin. The northern stretches of the Lehigh now sustain the region's robust outdoor recreation industry, which reinvigorated some of the depressed economies abandoned by extraction industries. Meanwhile, the southern section of river flows through the Lehigh Valley and serves a diverse population from working class rural folks that live in areas still dominated by agriculture to racially diverse and low income communities within the three cities of Allentown, Bethlehem and Easton.
Unfortunately, approximately half of the stream miles in this section of the watershed are considered degraded or impaired. And now, a new industry, distribution center warehouses and truck terminals, threatens water quality, community health, and the economic driver of the outdoor recreation industry. The developers and companies have a lot of talking points about jobs. As someone who grew up in anthracite coal country, what happens to the land happens to labor. And what happens to labor happens to communities. Abused and abandoned, poisoned water and poisoned bodies will be left in the wake of profit. The region has become the logistics hub of the eastern seaboard, and consequently, communities have watched roughly 106 million square feet or four square miles of land be devoured by this industry. For me, this fight is personal. Watching the land be consumed throughout this watershed breaks my heart. It was the lifeblood of the people that were here long before my ancestors ever stood foot on this shore. I cannot speak to the depths of their connection to the Lehigh, but I can say that it remains vital to the communities that reside across the watershed today. When I describe the warehouse issue to folks who don't live here, I tell them that the scale is like nothing you could imagine. It's our proximity to New York City, Philadelphia, and urban centers in New Jersey, and our relatively cheap land that inspires speculators and land developers to consume land at unimaginable rates across the watershed. Our land is being raised 100,000 square feet at a time for corporate profit, and our creeks streams and rivers are threatened because of it. The Chilkat River Valley is a truly unique place on our planet. The Klehini, Sirku, and Kicking Horse Rivers come together to join the Chilkat near the Clinket village of Klukwan, flow through the Chilkat Bald Eagle Preserve, and enter the Lynn Canal just beyond Haines, Alaska. These rivers still support all five wild species of salmon, King, Coho, Sockeye, Pink, and Chong. Warm upwellings into the Chilkat keep sections of the river from freezing into the winter months, which provides access to a late run of chum salmon to the largest congregation of eagles on Earth, who come here by the thousands every November. The natural bounty of this incredible ecosystem is the reason hundreds of brown bears live in the valley as well. Japanese and Canadian mine developers want to site a copper zinc mine just above the Klehini River, alongside its tributary, Glacier Creek, the second largest coho-producing stream in southeast Alaska. Copper is toxic to salmon. Just a few parts per billion can cause them to be disoriented and unable to find their home streams to spawn. A few parts per billion more causes reproduction deformities and death. Without the fish, the eagles and bears would soon be gone and the successful, sustainable communities of Klukwan and Haines, which depend on the fish in these rivers for food, culture, and their economic base from fishing and tourism, might soon follow. We need minerals, and we will always have mines. But that doesn't mean we must mine minerals wherever they are found. There are some places where other values are simply too important. Tens of thousands of miles of fish habitat in America have been sacrificed to the mining industry over the last 200 years it's time to draw a line in the riverbank. Please contact Alaska Representative Mary Peltola, Senator Lisa Murkowski, and the EPA and urge them to convince Alaska's resource permitting agencies to stop supporting the development of the Palmer Project. There is simply too much at stake for the people and wildlife of the Chilkat Valley, Alaska, and the nation for this project to move forward. The Rio Gallinas is the lifeblood for so many people in San Miguel County and has been for over 200 years. Our love and connection to our land and water is our cadencia. The Gallinas River is the source of water for the acequias and the agricultural community that exists all along the river. Uh, some people will simply look at it as an acequia system being an earth canal that delivers water to irrigated fields and crops, and that's their version of an acequia system. The acequia system is much more 
than that to the people that live along that Aseca system. That defines our relationship with each other as neighbors because we share water from the same system. We share labor to maintain the Aseca. And so the Aseca is a big fabric of the community itself. From the headwaters all the way down, there's enormous amount of uh, wildlife that relies on the river. We also have a lot of birds that fly through these areas in the winter, and so it sustains that kind of life. You know, I remember going up there as a little kid, you know, eight, nine, ten years old, and learning how to swim in, in that river up in the canyon, and me, you know, teaching my kids and my nephews and nieces, and that's where I learned how to fish. That's where I caught my first uh, brown trout up in the canyon right underneath Hermit's Peak. Our property is pinched between Anasekia and the Guyanas River, so I grew up walking the river, uh, playing at the river, and as well as using the irrigated land, cleaning the Anasekia in, in the early season of the year. It's been a tradition. It's a lifeline like the veins in the, in the blood of a lot of traditions and people from Las Vegas in the surrounding areas. It's part of their upbringing. And now we need to teach our younger generations the benefit of the Sequia, the benefit of the river, the benefit of water conservation so that the, the water is here in, in abundance for years to come. When my dad was a child growing up there, uh, he didn't have any recollection of it ever going dry. It goes dry almost every year now. And three, four years ago, I can't remember exactly, you know, we had 0% snowpack for the first time in recorded history. We don't know what the future looks like. The condition of the Rio Guinness represents that of many small rivers in the Southwest. River valleys were developed, and to use them for farming, ranching, and living, rivers were moved to one side of the valley. This caused them to be straightened, entrenched, disconnected from their floodplain, and vital features like pools and meanders were lost. Then entered climate change, which has really worsened the problems. And with it came the Hermit's Peak Cap Canyon fire. 75% of the Guyana's watershed burned. Last year, in 2022, the river ran black and brown for four months. Erosion in the watershed was severe, and we have five or more years of this to live through. So last year in 2022, we had the worst wildfire in New Mexico history. Much of the watershed in both tributaries of the Guayanas is completely destroyed. Well, number one reason why it's in jeopardy, in my personal opinion, is, is climate change and the lack of precipitation, the lack of snowpack, you know, the, the, the battles between the city and the acequias. And people that have had acequias and water rights up in the canyon where I live have been losing them left and right through the state. The city of Las Vegas, along with the uh, Asequia Users Association, have been in litigation for the last 40, 50 years, and that's coming to an end this year. We've come to a settlement on who has priority rights on the river. Uh, again, that's always gonna be uh, something that needs to be shared uh, between the municipal water supply and the agricultural lands and uh, irrigating those lands. I'm also concerned about the fish. I haven't seen brown trout since it started raining. I don't know where they're at. I don't know if they're all gone. I don't know if the ash and all the contaminants, um, kill. I don't know if it's gonna be healthy enough for our fisheries to replenish these rivers. But we used to see um, river rock in all the rivers and they're all full of sand. I can't see any rock and I can't see any fish. So that's one of, that's one of my other concerns um, about the river is, uh, is uh, the health of the river for our trout. Without widespread and thoughtful watershed restoration, the Rio Gainas and its communities will suffer for decades or longer. Even in, in your wildest dream, or the wildest dream of anybody that's ever been born on this earth, would have not have been able to come up with the game plan for Okie for Noki, just like they wouldn't have been able to do it for the Grand Canyon, or the Everglades, or the Redwoods of California. Or, or any other place, because it's, it's, it's not that kind of thing. It's not a man thing. It's a goodness thing. It's a spiritual thing. It's a God thing. Plain, simple, in stop. It's almost religious. I'm gonna cry. <laughs> you can feel God everywhere. You can just feel him. And that's, I think that's what I like about it. Essentially, Okefenokee Swamp is a very shallow lake full of 
interesting birds, interesting plants, lots of amphibians, reptiles, lots of alligators. It kind of looks like the Serengeti, except it's wet. This is the Okefenokee Swamp. More than 400,000 acres of wildness, the ancestral lands of Muscogee Creek, untouched, unspoiled, the largest blackwater wetland in the U.S. Though the swamp is shallow, it runs deep in the souls of the people that surround it, many whose roots run back hundreds of years. But the swamp doesn't just feed their souls. It supports a tourism industry that creates 826 jobs and $17.5 million in employment income annually. For the rest of us, the hundreds of thousands who visit the Okefenokee each year, and those that don't. The swamp provides everything from unprecedented wilderness experiences to clean water to a carbon sink that serves as a hedge against global climate change. But all of that could change if the state of Georgia chooses to allow mining interests to dig 50-foot deep pits in Trail Ridge, a sandy rise of land bordering the swamp in order to extract common titanium bearing minerals. Well, the Okefenokee, it is the swamp, but it also includes Trail Ridge. Trail Ridge is part of the National Wildlife Refuge itself. It's all connected. So if you care about the Okefenokee, you have to care about what's going on Trail Ridge. If you wanna protect what's on the inside, you need to protect what's on the outside. Hydrologists warn that mining Trail Ridge will lead to lower water levels in the swamp, setting off a series of impacts ranging from reduced recreational use of the swamp's boating trails to more frequent and intense wildfires. The beauty of the Okefenokee is it's a largely unmolested, unmodified system. We can avoid the problems in the Okefenokee by not letting them start. These 10 rivers and all the life that they support are at a crossroads. Their fate hangs in the balance. And I wanna thank our dedicated partners. We're proud to stand with them and support them in the effort to protect and restore these rivers. And we're grateful for their leadership. I hope you will join with us today to take action for clean water and wildlife, for public health and safety, for a better future. Thank you very much for your support. Together, we will make a difference for these rivers. <laughs>